I'll move this over here. Um, first of all, thank you very much, uh, Mihir, for setting all of this up and all of the hard work that you've uh, done in, in um, setting all of this up. And thank you also to the dean for, for your remarks and, and to all of you for coming. Um, my hope is that uh, my remarks today will be interesting. You might learn something. It might be a little bit provocative. It'll definitely be a little bit gross. Uh, but uh, hopefully you will uh, enjoy what I'm going to be talking about. Um, as as uh, Dr. Pandya said, I am a scholar of science and technology studies. Um, and what that means is that I study the context of science and technology. I think about how society, how politics, how history shape, uh, Dr. Pandya said, what we imagine to be technology, objective, neutral, um, and beyond social. And in part, I do that because I'm really dedicated to the question of how we can ensure that science and technology really achieve their public goals, right? That they really achieve the public interest. And often, that doesn't actually happen in practice. Um, and I'm going to be talking today about a couple of cases that are, that are complicated in a broader landscape that's even more complicated, um, and a historical landscape where the idea of technology for good or technology to lift up India has a very, very long uh, legacy. But I think that there are things that we might do today um, to help ensure that technology really achieves its promise. Technology has long been crucial to how India understands empowerment. Gandhi, of course, famously saw the spinning wheel as crucial to independence arguing that the best way for Indians to assert themselves against the British colonist was to make and wear their own clothes, using, of course, a spinning wheel. Later, he advocated for the establishment of what he called village industries, arguing that citizens would, could become self-sufficient by making the things that they needed, which would give them a sense of pride while empowering themselves economically. In some ways, Prime Minister Nehru's approach directly contradicted Gandhi. He famously celebrated bigness, right? He called dams famously the temples of modern India. And some of you might know uh, that this sort of, on the one hand, he's celebrating the bigness of this technology, this great technology dams. But of course, even there, there were costs, right? There were many people displaced people who d didn't necessarily have a voice in that process. Nehru also saw indi indigenous innovation in particular as a crucial route to empowerment, establishing import substitution policies that would enable Indians to make their own goods and establish technical expertise across industries. This allowed India, for example, to establish a healthy generic drug industry that has now enabled it to become the pharmacy of the global south. So this history has kind of enabled India to become somewhat fearless when it comes to innovation, and frankly, in comparison to its counterparts in the global south. It cultivates indigenous innovation in the hope that it will empower not just the nation state, but also the individual, and it has pride in this sort of unique approach to, uh, to indigenous innovation. It's really a leader uh, in that respect. So you can think about, for example, famously most recently, India's space program has broken all sorts of rules about the costs of high-tech innovation and high-tech operations to the moon and Mars. The government has funded the National Innovation Foundation, which is designed to encourage grassroots innovations, a term coined by Indian Institute of Management professor Anil Gupta. He talks about innovation and grassroots innovation in particular as being both by and for the poor. And he argues that because people may lack formal technical expertise and financial resources, that doesn't mean they're not innovative. And that both industry and policymakers can benefit by lifting up this kind of innovation, that it can 
eventually also become important for lifting up India. And it's important to note that, in fact, this idea of grassroots innovation, which I'll talk about more in just a few moments, has had broad impacts and influenced other countries to really think um, about the importance of grassroots innovation. India has also celebrated and even invested in the ideas of Stuart Hart and in Indian immigrant C.K. Prahalad, who for a time was a colleague of mine at the University of Michigan. He's an Indian immigrant to the, uh, to the United States, um, and he was a business school professor at University of Michigan. Hart and Prahalad tried to convince large companies that had an interest in serving, that they had an interest in serving people with limited incomes because there was, in their terms, a fortune at the bottom of the pyramid. Some of you may have heard of that language, the bottom of the pyramid. Nowadays, as you'll see later in my talk, we even refer to communities as bottom of the pyramid or BOP uh, communities. Their theory went something like this. If large companies targeted products, which usually had to be innovated to be cheaper to these populations, then the companies would help the poor, who would be empowered both by their access to these products as well as their participation in the marketplace. It was a win-win-win situation. And so, you know, an iconic example of this is the production of individual shampoo sachets that you can buy, you can see in most, you know, small markets in India. Um, and the idea is if someone has access to these shampoo sachets, then they might be able to be cleaner and therefore more acceptable to an employer, they might get employed, then they would increase their participation in the marketplace, and at the same time, the company would also benefit. Another example, of course, is the, uh, is the idea of Jugad, which some of you will have heard of. Uh, the idea that innovation is also about making do with what you have, which is common at the Indian level, uh, at the individual level in India. In fact, there's even this term, Hindi term for it. So the question that I'm gonna be talking about today um, is have the, so these are all these ideas that I've talked about, Gupta's ideas, Hart and Prahalad's ideas, are collectively called inclusive innovation. And the question that I'm going to be talking about today is have these ideas, which scholars and policymakers have taken up in various ways, have they worked? Have they empowered low-income communities in particular and marginalized communities more broadly in India? And in these contexts where there's a lot of talk about empowerment, what does empowerment actually mean? These are the questions that we'll be wrestling with today. Um, before I tell you a little bit about those cases that I'm going to be working on, which are in the area of sanitation and hygiene, I want to put the idea of technology-enabled empowerment into some context. There's a long history of what scholars in my field, science and technology studies, call tech solutionism. The idea that technologies can be invented to solve our social and public problems. An iconic example is the One Laptop Per Child program, which Nicholas Negroponte from the famous MIT Media Lab argued what could revolutionize education across the global south. So his idea was that he could create a rugged, low-cost computer that would be dropped into you know, countries across the global south and, and later on low-income communities in the United States as well. Uh, and you know, students would be curious, they would use these technologies, it, they would learn by using those technologies and it would make them um, more excited about education and improve their uh, uh, lot in the long term. The only problem with this idea, and this is usually the problem with tech solutionism, is that he didn't really understand anything about the context or think about the daily practices with technology. And so not surprisingly, the One Laptop Per Child program largely failed. And this is a common story. Uh, invariably, the technologist overestimates the power of the technology to transform the world and underestimates the importance and the stickiness of the context. So in the case of the One Laptop Per Child program, as you can see an image of here, the computers frequently broke, there were no repair services, there were uh, assumptions about how they would be powered, 
Uh, there was no effort to translate them into local languages in a serious way, nor to consider the local context. Critics of tech solutionism point out that the problem usually arises because the technologist is quite far from the intended user population. Geographically, as in the case of Nicholas Negroponte, who is based at, as I said, the MIT Media Lab in the United States, or in terms of social class, or race, or gender. And often, by virtue of being technologists, they diminish the knowledge of those who have some sort of social expertise, whether experts in the humanities or the social sciences or the user communities themselves. But the cases that I'm talking about today are a little bit different. Um, they aren't external impositions on low-income communities like Nicholas Negroponte's laptop. The innovators are Indian and often from the communities themselves. In the cases I'll be talking about, the transformation is supposed to be not just about the object, but also the inclusion in the marketplace. And the results are a little more complicated too. They certainly aren't spectacular failures by the standards of the One Laptop Per Child project, but I'm hoping that the nuances will force all of us to think a little bit harder about the use of technology for good and its implications and how we might approach technological innovation differently if we are truly dedicated to social equity and justice. So just to give you a sense of what I'll be talking about today, I'll talk a little bit about the broader context around sanitation and hygiene and specifically more about the rise of inclusive innovation that I've already told you a little bit about. And then I'll talk about four case studies of inclusive innovation in this sanitation and hygiene space. And all along, I'll try to, you know, sort of have pointers about the sort of relationship between technology and empowerment, um, and then, you know, sort of close, and hopefully we'll have some good time for, for discussion. So the water, this is a very sensitive uh, clicker I've discovered. Um, so my research focuses on technological innovation in the areas of sanitation and hygiene. As I said, it's usually referred to in, in international development circles as the WASH sector. It includes water as well, uh, but I'll just be focusing on sanitation and hygiene. Um, it's been a significant area of concern in low and middle income countries and specifically India for decades and decades. Um, in the area of sanitation, the primary concern has been the disposal of human excreta. In the Indian context, it's also deeply tied to both colonialism and to caste. Modern sewer infrastructure is dated back to the middle of the 19th century when India was a British colony. The British built sewer systems in Indian cities, but primarily in the cantonments where the British officials were, and they did not extend them much beyond that, certainly not um, into the rural areas. Even when uh, India became independent, uh, there was a calculation made both in the Indian government but also by international organizations that trying to extend any sewer infrastructure would be too costly. Instead, uh, there was a decision made that it would, they would focus instead on individual toilet facilities at the point, uh, at the point of use. In addition, uh, you know, so as a result of this, most people defecate it outside. And for those who practices, practiced Hinduism in particular, defecation was seen as a, as a dirty practice to perf be performed far away from cooking, eating, and praying. Depending on climate and geography, the human excreta would dry out and fertilize the soil, but in some cases, of course, they contaminated the water and food and caused disease. Some defecated in dry latrines, which created a need for someone to remove and dispose of it, of course. Uh, and as I said, you know, the, we didn't want to be uh, necessarily, most people didn't want to have anything to do with that. For that, people employed manual scavengers, the lowest caste in the, Indian, in, in the Hindu caste system. They were paid a meager amount and they were treated extremely poorly. Uh, and often, and, and we'll come back to this theme again, the, their livelihoods were tied to their morality, even though they were essential workers, to put it in today's terms, right? The higher caste depended on them. Gandhi was deeply concerned with these issues. He felt that open defecation created unsanitary conditions. 
He was distressed by how manual scavengers was, were treated. He felt that the hi higher castes had the responsibility to recognize and respect this practice and also help these manual scavengers improve their social and economic conditions. When India gained independence, the government initially focused on both problems. The health problems caused by open defecation as well as the plight of manual scavengers. It and international organizations, as I suggested, could have invested their resources in a variety of ways, including sewer infrastructure, which would ensure proper waste disposal and removal of excreta from the premises of homes and businesses that residents were particularly keen to keep clean. But as I said, they saw sewer infrastructure as too costly and difficult to construct, so they focused on toilets as the solution and engaged in multiple efforts over the decades to make India open defecation free, or ODF. They donated toilets to communities and individuals. They provided subsidies for people to purchase and build toilets themselves. They tried to stimulate demand by trying to convince citizens that their daily practices were disgusting. Most of these efforts, you'll notice, focused on addressing the health problems of open defecation and not necessarily manual scavenging. We'll come back to this point. There were, however, occasional efforts to address manual scavenging. In 1993, the Indian government banned dry latrines, thinking this might stop the practice. Activists later convinced the government to set aside funds to rehabilitate manual scavengers to uplift the caste. And they even tried to build socially conscious technology. So social reformer Bindeshwar Patak created the idea of twin pit toilets and then, and then developed multiple versions depending on geology and environment. These, at least in theory, would remove the need for a scavenger. The idea was that one pit would fill while the other would be composted and so you could harvest, harvest the compost um, and distribute it and then you know, switch, to the, switch back to that pit. So it would always be a, in a composting situation. But of course, it's a cultural problem, right? The issue was that nobody wanted to remove the compost either, right? It's a recurrent problem. So you're, you know, technology isn't, isn't necessarily um, going to fix it, right? So I just want to point out the lure of infrastructural or technological solutions, even at this early, even these earlier stages, right? They're initially constructed as seemingly simple and even magical, especially when accompanied by, with an educational strategy, right? So you build toilets and then you convince people to use the, to use the toilets. Um, and then they're shaping also the problem, right? So the, the problem of manual scavenging kind of recedes over time and the health problem becomes this, the, the, the central issue that the, that the Indian government in particular is trying um, to address. But nothing really is working, um, in part because these are very much rooted in cultural issues. They're not necessarily technological problems. Estimates vary, but in 2014, both the Indian government and international organizations estimated that significant percentages of the population still defecated in the open, and that this could be linked to persistent infectious disease and childhood mortality. The practice of manual scavenging didn't end, and it didn't eradicate discrimination against the caste. Nor did it make the practice safer. Manual scavengers experienced disease and death because they had to clean up everybody else's shit, right? And they often had to do so completely unprotected. So this situation, this persistent situation that you know, sort of is happening over decades and decades and decades, collides with the rise of inclusive innovation in the early 2000s. Its origins are multi-sided including the ideas of C.K. Prahalad and Anil Gupta that I mentioned before. The idea is that there is growing awareness among international organizations of persistent socioeconomic inequality and concerns about the impacts on public trust. At the same time, you have the rise of the tech industry. It might be difficult to recall now, but this was a moment of heady excitement about tech and the extraordinary accomplishments of Silicon Valley. Proponents of inclusive innovation like Rajiv Shah, who was at the time the head of the US Agency for International Development, he's now the head of the Rockefeller Foundation, and Bill Gates, who had just launched the Gates Foundation, 
Imagine turning the power of tech innovation in the private sector to address the concerns of the marginalized, especially low-income communities in the global south. So Bill Gates, for example, says that the, uh, when, the Bill, when the Gates uh, Foundation is created, that he's optimistic that innovation will allow us to avoid these bleak outcomes in health and education, climate change, and food. In the United States, he said, advances in online learning and new ways to help teachers improve will make a great education more accessible than ever. With vaccines, drugs, and other improvements, health in poor country countries will continue to get better. People will choose to have smaller families. With better seeds, training, and access to markets, farmers in poor countries will be able to grow more food. The world will find clean ways to produce electricity at a lower cost, and more people will lift themselves out of poverty, right? Um, so here the idea is that innovation will not only produce wonderful technologies, they will stimulate markets and enable people to lift themselves out of poverty. And the, and the sort of verb is important here and the, you know, the sort of language that, that people will be able to uh, individually lift themselves out of poverty and empower themselves, right? The basic idea was the following. If leaders can encourage innovation, both for and by the poor, it will create a win-win-win, as I said before. The innovators will win because they'll gain revenues. Marginalized communities will win because, first, because they have access to innovation uh, as consumers. And inclusive innovation would enable marginalized communities' market participation as laborers. Increased consumption com combined with increased labor force participation would, under this theory, allow marginalized communities to improve their socioeconomic status, right? So this is the you know, broad set of ideas emerging in the 2000s and into the, into the 2010s that kind of collides with um, this ongoing concern about sanitation and, and hygiene, especially in India. So in 2010, the Gates Foundation established the Reinvent the Toilet Challenge, which offered grants to researchers, primarily at universities, who were interested in prototyping, conceptualizing, and designing a single family facility that takes in the bodily waste of an entire family and outputs useful waste fractions, water, urea, salt, and minerals, immediately and safely in usable forms, in an energy and cost efficient manner, less than uh, five cents a day for a period of not less than 20 years. Talk about a tall order for a technology, right? And of course, these are just the technical parameters, right? We've already, you know, I've already talked about how there are all kinds of uh, extraordinary hopes pinned on, uh, on this kind of innovation. At the time, there were already critiques that Open defecation wasn't a science or technology problem, right? That seems like you would, would, we would have already established this at this point, right? But that didn't stop uh, Bill Gates or any of the people that, that I'll be talking about today. The foundation aimed to create an elegant technical solution that would entice demand. So the director of the WASH program at the Gates Foundation described their strategy. And I think that this is such a telling uh, way, a telling quote. So he says, ultimately, we're looking for reinvented toilets that would define the new gold standard in sanitation. Toilets that everyone will aspire to have. The cell phone, the iPad, the Kindle of sanitation. Now, of course, this is a little dated, right? Today, it might be the large language model of sanitation, the generative AI of sanitation, the chat GPT of sanitation. Um, but the point is that it wasn't just about the innovation, right? It was the fact that innovation excites us. And we want to all be part of this world of innovation. And that was going to be the catalytic moment that got everyone uh, to, you know, so to adopt the proper, um, proper social practices. Right? So over the next few years, the Gates Foundation held additional reinvent the toilet fairs, including national ones in India and China. In 2014, Prime Minister Modi announced Swachh Bharat, which some of you may have heard of, or the Clean India campaign. Its primary goal was making India, finally, open defecation free, or ODF. 
What's interesting, and some of you may not know this, is that actually his policies, for the most part, weren't all that different than what had happened before. Um, subsidies for toilet construction, funding for educational campaigns. There was, however, massive marketing. Um, and there was also significant investment in inclusive innovation, both by the government and by private entities who were taking advantage of this newfound attention to the cause. It led to a variety of startups that I'm going to be talking about um, more today. So I'll talk a little bit, as I said, I'm going to talk about four different cases. So the first is Garve Toilets. So Garve Toilets offers a smart toilet, and it was a, a company that was established in 2015 by uh, Mayank Mida, who is um, you know, an entrepreneur with a background both in business administration and in rural management. And the idea he had was that um, you know, if you offer a toilet with automated flushing, and cleaning, and it's stainless steel, it's solar powered, right? It's your perfect reinvented toilet. Um, then it's going to have, you know, it's going to be like the chat GPT of sanitation. He, you know, his toilet recycles the waste, it all, and he has special versions um, for women and children. It, it's, it's Bill Gates' ideal innovation with loads of bells and whistles. Uh, it, uh, he has a variety of options. There are toilets with showers and hand washing and sanitary pad vending machines, incinerators for disposing those sanitary pads. Um, there are, you know, often the financial models vary, but sometimes the user pays a fee, sometimes it's purchased by the government, and, and so there's no subsidy, but so, so that varies. But there is some sort of commercial, often commercial dynamic here where you have to pay uh, pay for the use, but there's another commercial dynamic, which is a very 21st century uh, dimension, which is that um, it is in the you know to sort of uh, borrow from the scholar Shushana you you Zuboff, uh, there's a bit of a touch of surveillance capitalism or the hope of surveillance capitalism here, because what these smart toilets also do is collect a whole load of data. Right? It has the cap capacity to collect aggregated data on user hygiene, where they track the number of users, the percentage of users flushing or washing hands. And the idea is that you can track those data points to have an insight on user behavior so that they can positively work with communities on behavior change aspects in the long term. Right? Um, and it's not surprising that this startup is the, has been a darling of the inclusive innovation movement. And this is one of the things that's very interesting with inclusive innovation is that, you know, the, they are often the recipients of lots of awards and, you know, startup, they, they become part of these incubators and accelerators. Um, so it's gotten funding directly from uh, Swatch Bharat. It was a winner in the Sanitation Innovation ex uh, Accelerator and other similar things. It also got attention from some of the Indian Institutes of Technology. It's won international awards, right? That's a way that you know that this is sort of the, uh, an ideal version of, of um, this technology. It also attracted support from multinational companies. It was part of the Toilet Board Coalition's Accelerator program and the Toilet Board Coalition was something that was created basically after Swatch Bharat to kind of increase the idea of a, 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 of a sanitation economy, um, essentially. For Garv, empowerment is about cleanliness through access to toilets, and on some level about protecting women and children, right? So they, that's the idea behind having these different kinds of, of technologies. It's also important to note, though, how empowerment is constrained. The market orientation of the technology means that most of Garb's toilets were actually urban, um, and those people already had access to toilets often. Um, so, these, so, the, so then it sort of uh, leads us to question whether the idea was about increasing access at all. And this is something that's actually quite interesting, which is that the whole Swatch Bharat campaign and the campaign to make India open defecation free was about increasing access to toilets. But so many of the inclusive innovation, the market model kind of doesn't work in rural areas, and so therefore it doesn't actually achieve that, um, that particular goal. 
It also, as I said, helped to produce data as a potential commodity with little attention to privacy or security or the knock-on effects of, uh, of data um, commodification. Another thing that I think is really important to keep in mind is that there's a lot of language here about dignity. And you'll see that dignity kind of rhetoric occur over and over again, um, which I think is, is very interesting. It suggest, and it sort of also calls into question what we mean by empowerment, because if, we're, if it's about achieving dignity, then dignity is sort of determined by the moral order, right? It's not necessarily clear that, that a technology is actually going to solve that. So in the case of garb toilets, for example, um, they talk, the, you know, sort of one of the ways in which Mitha talks about what the purpose of what he's doing is, he says, by providing access to clean and well-maintained sanitation services to people in BOP communities, Garb is able to restore the pride of a people whose dignity was compromised by the lack of proper sanitation facilities, right? Um, but is the dignity compromised by the technology or is the dignity compromised by the society? There seems to be, you know, sort of an assumption that it's about the technology, which may actually be the, the part of the, the problem here. So a second case um, is Jalodbust. Uh, Jalodbust is a company based in Bangalore, in Bengaluru, in South India. Um, it was established in 2019. Uh, by a gentleman who had spent an entire career in the Air Force um, and who had been um, distressed by the plight of manual scavengers and in his telling that he saw in the newspaper one day that um, someone had died um, in, through manual scavenging and you know they hadn't been properly protected. They had gone into a sewer tank, I think, in Bangalore, in Bangalore and, and, and died. And so he thought, I, I have to do something about it. And the idea here was that he was going to create a robotic scavenger. right? So the idea was that this would be a device designed for cleaning septic tanks. And it would eliminate the need for manual scavenging. And it would enable the person who you know, sort of previously was engaged in manual scavenging to work with the technology and therefore lift up their uh, their lives, right? So you know, you're no, you now you're you are a techno you're you have technical skills. You're using this uh, uh, device, and that will provide um, uh, more dignified work as well as reputational benefits by your proximity with the technology. And here too, there's a market dimension. Of course, there's the person who purchases the services. But the idea was that this robotic scavenger would be something that an individual would purchase themselves on loan and then you know, sort of pay off over time. So ja Jalud Book's uh, tagline you see here is literally what I've sort of been talking about explicitly, right? Dignity through technology. But then as you read further, and this is also true in sort of other kinds of language, both um, that uh, Rakesh, who's the owner, uh, uses, but also in, in other materials, right? there's a language about, there's a set of assumptions about the morality of those manual scavengers. So he talks about how, you know, at the bottom of the social pyramid lies the manual scavenger. With the lowest wage expectancy, they keep sinking in depravity and social disability. Their lowest wage expectancy itself beats the financial viability of any intervention technology. Modern society must lend a helping hand to pull someone out of the hole that was created by modern sanitary systems. Right? So again, you see this sort of interesting slippage. Right? The assumption that technology can pull this individual out of the situation, while at the same time reinforcing certain moral codes about who the manual scavenger is and what their social plight is. And they're sort of being you know, driven to social depravity often. You know, so for example, Rakesh will talk about how you know, because they're ma manual scavengers, they're driven to drinking because that's the only way that they can manage to live their lives without sort of seeing that you know, actually this is a cultural problem again, right? not necessarily a technological one. So the company's language is striking. It could have emphasized the physical dangers of manual scavenging. But instead, it suggests that manual scavenging exacerbates immoral behavior, which increases 
the burden on society. Embedded in this language is also an implicit defense of higher caste people who ostracize manual scavengers, right? The problem, Jalodbust argues, lies in the practice and in the technology, which drives laborers to drink heavily and engage in other immoral behaviors in order to cope. It's not the problem of the higher castes who put those individuals in that position. So now I'm going to switch. Ah. So there's also another layer of challenges in this situation. There are problems with, as you can imagine, right? So as, as some of you will know, uh, Prime Minister Modi famously announced in 2019 that India had become open defecation free. But the problem with open defecation free is someone has to clean it all up. Who's going to do that? The manual scavengers, of course, right? And so in fact, statistics show that the number of deaths from manual scavengers has gone up in recent years. Um, and what you see in the middle there is a protest in Delhi um, trying to bring attention to this cause and great concern that with the rise of toilets and the rise of inclusive innovation ostensibly designed to help this population, that the concerns of this population are actually getting erased, right? So there have been all of these efforts to try to say, but there's some policy efforts to say we're going to eradicate manual scavenging. There are technological efforts to say there's eradicating manual scavenging. The problem is that it's eradicating discussion about manual scavenging, but not at all eradicating the practice of manual scavenging. And so I'll talk a little bit perhaps at the end about, and perhaps in Q&A, about what other strategies might work. But I, but I think that it's important to, to remember that. It, these are, it, it's one of the things that I think is so interesting and important when it comes to sort of tech solutionism generally and tech-enabled empowerment in particular is that the beauty, the spectacle of technology often hides some of these kinds of problems. Another problem that a lot of my interlocutors have talked about is that with technologies like Garve toilets, um, or similar other smart toilet systems in India is that the problem is that uh, you know local bodies have to pay for all of the automated this that and the other thing you know the sensors to know when something needs to be maintained and of course the governments don't want to do that or they don't have the funds to do it so now you have a secondary problem which is that now you have smart toilets that are there right they're new built infrastructure that are in disrepair, massive disrepair. Those of you who've been to India may have seen some examples of this, right? So that actually ends up harming public trust, you know, right? If, if the toilets that you have that you've built aren't working, then that doesn't necessarily encourage anyone um, to use them. Uh, and a similar case here, the, the, another case that I saw personally, which is much lower tech, but I think also makes the point, is a case from Gujarat where you see here, actually if you look, you can see three toilets in this image. It's all on the same compound. Um, and I'm sorry to say that the third toilet was built by students at University of Michigan um, from something called the Blue Lab program, right? So I don't know if Cal State has a program like this. Many universities do, which is really buying into the inclusive innovation idea, which is, you know, we want to give students this opportunity to learn how to um, um, innovate. They want, they're interested in having, you know, in, in contributing to social good. So let's do that. Um, and, and in this case, what you see, it's not obvious, um, but the first toilet, I think the first toilet um, was a Swatch Bharat, you know, regular old Swatch Bharat subsidy toilet. I think it was, as I recall, it was, you know, sort of used to store grain. Um, you know, and the second toilet was built because the first toilet wasn't being used. The second toilet was dirt, you know, something went, broke. Um, and so that wasn't being used. The third toilet, the, the Michigan toilet is now, they say, oh, right. So this is the way that the inclusive innovation story goes, you know, just in a shorter period of time. The inclusive innovation story is, oh, right, the problem 
was not lack of desire, maybe people didn't want the toilet, et cetera. It was that, oh, what you needed really was a comp self-composting toilet. So that was the fancy innovation, right? The chat GPT of, of, of toilets that, that um, you know, students from University of Michigan um, uh, built. And you know the end of this story, right? It's not like that one's being used as a toilet either. So, um, so you have three toilets that are gonna be there for hundreds of years, right? Um, in a village where there are no other toilets. And it also causes interesting political questions within the village because everybody's asking why does this fam why is why are all these toilets being built here? Why, you know, why are you not dealing with the other pro you know, I asked someone in the village about uh, you know, sort of what are the things you care about? And, and a woman pointed to the fact that the water had just come on and she said, you know, we're losing all this water, right? We have no way of capturing all this water. We need water. That's what we care about. I don't know why these people are building all these toilets. Um, another, another challenge um, is that, you know, I talked about one of the, one of the dynamics of this inclusive innov innovation movement, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in a second, is the creation of um, sort of labor forces um, to support the development of this technology. And in, and in, um, and in the case of, in the toilet case, not actually the two uh, companies that I talked about, another company says, okay, we're, the problem is about modularity and we're gonna help people learn how to build toilets. In other cases, they say, well, we're gonna use community-based surveillance in order to monitor whether people are using these toilets. So that's another way of creating a labor force. Um, and you know, that has, I think, also um, somewhat problematic, we found somewhat problematic uh, consequences, of course, for empowerment, because you have more community surveillance being created, sometimes even violence. There are cases where people um, lose access to social services because they're not behaving properly in this technologically mediated world. Um, so this is sort of the world that's, that's getting created um, with these sorts of technologies. So I'm going to spend the rest of my time talking a little bit about the other set of cases that I've been focusing on. And I should say that I'm deliberately focused, right? So on the one hand, these are sort of things we don't usually talk about. But that's what sort of makes it so fascinating that it's the site of so much innovation, right? I mean, that's why it's, it's to me anyway, compelling as somebody who spent much of my time focusing on things like biotechnology and artificial intelligence. So the next set of cases is about menstrual health and hygiene. Um, so some of you have probably heard about um, the problem of menstrual health and hygiene in India, and in particular, the problem of lack of access to disposable sanitary pads. Um, one of the things, there are many things that are interesting about this. This has this problem, whereas the problem of open defecation or manual scavenging, you know, is really a centuries long problem in India. The problem of he menstrual health and hygiene is a, is a 20 year old problem. It's, and it's quite interesting because if you look at the history of it, you know, it's not something that's discussed even at the 1994 famous Beijing conference on women. It's not discussed at the Millennium or, uh, Millennium or Sustainable Development Goals. Um, it emerges around 2005 um, when a, a Western public health expert is in, um, in her case, she was in Africa and she says, you know, I had trouble accessing uh, menstrual products. I wonder if this is a problem. She starts writing papers, um, others join her and there's, and, and so public health experts start to do what are called knowledge attitudes and practices studies. This is a common method in, in public health to assess you know, the situation vis-a-vis um, -vis public health. It, historically, it's primarily been used around contraception and family planning um, in a particular context. So they started to use this and they discovered, oh, there are a lot of Indian girls and women, um, as well as girls and women, especially in, in, in Africa and across South Asia, who don't use disposable products. They use instead, historically, cloth uh, absorbents. Um, and so they say, okay, this is, this is a problem. And they start to link it to both health and education. So these might be statistics that you've heard of, you know, that 23% of girls drop out of school because they don't have access 
to sanitary pads. Now, when you look at those studies a little bit more carefully, you realize that around the same percentage of boys also drop out um, around that time. And of course, the question is, is you know, are, do we need to give boys the sanitary pads too? Um, right? And there's also, uh, you know, there was also concern that girls are missing school because they don't have access um, to these disposable sanitary pads. Now, over time, all of this work has been questioned in all sorts of ways, um, but it didn't really matter um, in this context, in part because at this very moment, there is an emerging technological solution. And this is the story of, some of you may have heard of or seen the film Padman, um, you know, or heard of the, you know, he's also been called the sanitary pad revolutionary, Arunachalam Murugananthum, who's a man from South India um, with a high school education, less than a high school education, um, as the story goes. Um, he, uh, you know, uh, gets married, realizes that women menstruate, uh, and, and then goes to the, you know, corner store and sees, realizes that disposable sanitary, he thinks he'll buy disposable sanitary pads for his wife and he realizes that they're expensive and she freaks out because he spent all this money on disposable sanitary pads. And she's like, you know, what I'm doing is fine and why are you even dealing with this? And, you know, there's something very interesting about this story. I'm not going to go into all the details, but, um, but one of the things that's very interesting he has been someone who has been feted at, you know, he's given TED Talks, he's been feted at the UN. As you'll see in the next slide, he sat on the stage with Bill Gates. Um, but his story, the way that it's told, is told just like, you know, Isaac Newton and Benjamin Franklin. I mean, there's a sort of trope of the innovator, and the Murugananthum story very much sort of fits that. So he sort of fits into this, like, oh, okay, we've got an innovator now, we've got this great innovation, low-cost disposable sanitary pads. Right? And the collision of these two things is all we need. So first, UNICEF starts buying these, uh, you know, his pads, and eventually the Indian government in, in 2010 says we're going to have a national program to ensure that all um, girls, of menstru all, all adolescent girls have access to um, uh, uh, these, these uh, sanitary napkins. And what's interesting about this is that it's not just, sorry, we're very sensitive. There we go. Um, so what's interesting about this story is that, again, right, so the, the, the model of, um, of, of inclusive innovation is it's not just about the, the new innovative product. It's also about the creation of a labor force, right? So in this case, it's not that Murugananthum is just making an, a low-cost disposable sanitary pad. He is making a machine, or set of machines in his case, uh, for people to make and sell low-cost disposable sanitary pads. And again, in this case, as in actually many of the sanitation cases, the idea is that this package of machines um, is in, you know, usually what happens is that some sort of nonprofit organization purchases the set of machines and then they donate them to a self-help group, a women's self-help group, which are, you know, across, now across South Asia, small groups of women, 10 to 15 women. Um, you know, these are, these are groups that were sort of formed um, in the wake of microfinance and microcredit. The idea is that they could get um, these loans and create small businesses. And so in this, you know, it gets leveraged in this case to create small sanitary pad making enterprises, right? And so you're, you're seeding the sanitary pad economy, hygiene economy to kind of go along with the sanitation economy created by toilets, um, a, a, a hygiene economy across the country with little enterprises um, and they're selling to their local schools and then getting money from the government, uh, government to do this. And so this is, you know, sort of, again, you know, in some ways, one, you might be thinking to yourself, well, this is kind of low tech, actually, right? Um, but what's interesting about this is that it's innovative in terms of making it low cost, but it's also innovative, it's seen as innovative because it's creating these kinds of economies, essentially. 
So Muraganantham's invention then creates a whole, you know, a whole um, mushrooming of other kinds of uh, invention in this space. So you have the creation of biodegradable sanitary pads. You have the creation of um, new kinds of incinerators. Because now, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in a second, but you know, you, you have uh, a world in which women are using reusable cloth sanitary pads which I'll just note as an aside, of course, is nowadays in the US, we all talk about sustainability and there were articles in the New York Times about period underwear and reusable <laughs> sanitary pads, right? So, so there's something interesting about morality and modernity that's also embedded in this story that's echoed again with the toilet story. Um, but here modernity becomes the disposable sanitary pad, but it creates a whole new problem of disposal and garbage, right? And so then they say, oh right, well we gotta innovate our way out of that problem. Okay, how do you innovate your way out of that problem? You buy an incinerator. Oh wait, now you're creating toxic pollution, right? The net, we haven't figured out that that hasn't yet been solved. But the, where this is, you know, sort of you, you, the, the tech solutionism, begetting tech solutionism um, story. So the other, here we go. So, as I said, you have, um, you know, all kinds of innovations that are building on top of this. And Sarel Designs, you know, is just one uh, company that I chose to spotlight here because I thought, in the interest of time, it was a, a useful um, uh, to talk about in the context of Morgan Anthem's invention. And basically here, you know, again, it's a startup that crea is created in the last 10 years. They take Muraganantham's idea and they just automate it a little bit more. So you can, you know, and they have now different versions of levels of automation um, for the sanitary pad making machines. Um, and the same kind of idea, they have, um, you know, they sell it to self help groups. The self help groups sell the pads. They get the self help groups in this idea become part of the, um, you know, hygiene economy. But they also have um, something they call sanginis. And in the sangani system, those are, those are women who go out and you know, sort of uh, are marketing the sanitary pads, right? Sort of the Avon lady, I suppose, of, you know, right? A Tupperware version of, of, uh, of, of sanitary pads. So you see this, this kind of economy also getting created. Um, and so I'll just stop here um, with a, a couple of final thoughts um, and then I look forward to sort of questions and, and discussion. So, you know, my talk more generally or my thinking uh, more generally, you know, I'm in the midst of, of working on a book project around this and I'm interested in thinking about, you know, what are the political and moral consequences of this move towards inclusive innovation. And the first thing I want to suggest, right, and, and I've sort of talked around this, but I want to make it explicit, that the, the theory of change in the idea of inclusive innovation, right, is that with the rise of new technologies with innovation, you have market inclusion, either as consumption, in terms of consumption, in terms of labor, that that produces economic empowerment, right, and that economic empowerment will produce dignity, right? Um, it doesn't necessarily, you know, you have consumers and laborers, but the empowerment is limited. It's constrained in different ways. It's constrained in terms of conventional understandings of what constitutes dignity, right? The moral order isn't really changing. It's sort of um, expanding these, the innovations become tools for expanding moral order at the, time, at the same time that we're expanding the market. Um, and, these are, you know, the sort of people who are the uh, um, recipients of this inclusive innovation, let's say, are not, don't necessarily have agency in influencing what the problems are that inclusive innovation is, is meant to solve, right? They, you know, they aren't necessarily saying that either defecation is a problem or that menstrual hygiene is a problem, but they are meant to be empowered by those solutions, and that has you know, political consequences in terms of the amount, the kind and amount of agency that they might have. Um, and so that's one 
kind of example of the, of the questions that I'm asking and the things that I'm thinking about. But it's more generally a question of what gets lost with techno technologically enabled empowerment, right? You might gain economic empowerment, but what are the kinds of political and moral empowerment um, that are either lost or the opportunities that are not taken, for example. Um, so one of the things that uh, one of the um, organizations that represents manual scavengers talks about is how maybe the answer is actually unionizing manual scavenging um, as a means of gaining political power um, as opposed to a technological uh, solution. And I think that that's interesting for a, a variety of reasons, but it suggests that maybe there are directions um, that uh, to gain empowerment that are not, you know, where technology isn't actually the solution, it's actually um, creating more problems or at least not solving the problems that it's, that it's um, designed to, to solve. Um, and, but it's hard because, of course, technologies seem like they're simple and magic solutions um, and it's difficult to imagine, um, you know, sort of how to get the same kind of excitement um, around, for example, a political or union solution, um, even though it might actually produce broader uh, kinds of empowerment. Um, so I'll stop there uh, and maybe take some questions. I think for me, what's interesting is um, the difficulty of these cases, right? Um, I think some of, you know, many of us in, our, in this room may care about these communities, uh, may care about ensuring that these communities are empowered, are interested in social good, um, and what's interesting to me is that, you know, these are, these are difficult, um, uh, these raise difficult issues. Um, and I'm hoping that maybe together we can um, figure out what better solutions might be. Yes? Uh, what do you think about uh, large companies that invest in expensive technology um, and they provide the products at a very low cost like for example the uh, Serum Institute of India mm -hmm. you know which is um, uh, owned by the Mr. Sayas Kunawala and other Kunawala they happen to be from my Parsi community that's why I'm bringing it <laughs> up but, but they are known as the largest producer of vaccines you know yeah and uh, they provide it to not only to India, but also to poor countries mm -hmm. in Africa and Asia, you know. And like, for example, when the COVID in, uh, thing came about, you know, they invested uh, in advance into the technology and setup, even though it was not yet certified, the drug from Zeneca Pharmacy or something. Right, right. And they took the risk of, you know, doing all that, and they provided it very low cost. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great, I'm so glad you asked that question, because, um, well, both because a lot of my pre previous work was on intellectual property, um, but also because I think it's, it's a really interesting case. So, you know, what is interesting to me about inclusive innovation in some ways is that, as I suggested at the beginning, right, in some ways this is also about India-based, you know, innovation and, and a unique approach that India has, right? You know, it, it is, uh, promoting this unique approach to innovation to the world, just like um, the ways that India's approach to intellectual property and generic drugs is also a source of great pride and um, you know, is, being, is, is helping a broader set of people. There are a couple of differences, I would say, right? So the first is that I think that at the end of the day, this is, this is not really challenging the conventional um, political and, and moral distribution that the market, the traditional market approach provides in the way that the generic drug industry does, right? So the generic drug industry and other policies in India around pharmaceuticals are actually challenging conventional ideas, for example, about intellectual property. Right, so in addition to the generic drug industry, there's a famous case from a few years ago of uh, India say, you know, essentially not accepting um, uh, the um, 
conventional Western approach to intellectual property. So they say, no, we're not going to, you know, sort of essentially allow patents forever because there's a public interest reason why we need to limit the power of patent holders and limit the power of market players, to put it bluntly, right? Whereas in some ways, the stories that I'm telling are actually saying, you know, we want to give all of the power to market players, right, in sort of conven in pretty conventional ways, but also say that that's an indigenous, you know, Indian, Indian approach. So I think that that's one difference. Uh, but I will say, right, it's also important to remember that in the, um, in the case that you're talking about, in the COVID case that you're talking about, um, India did sort of, yes, they were far ahead, but then when everybody wanted to take advantage of the Indian vaccine and India was experiencing a, a serious COVID crisis, they were, they stopped that, right? So there are, there are interesting political dynamics there as well. Yes. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I was interested in hearing you talk a little bit more about, I think like your term for it, but something like the, the aesthetic of innovation, or the customization of, like the, of gadgetry. So what's, what's your term and how are you sort of thinking about why we invest so much energy into the thing and the innovation of I think I called it techno-moralism. I'm trying different terms. Maybe that's not what you're referring to exactly, but certainly tech, you know, fetishization, right? I mean, I think, I can't tell, especially in recent weeks, I've been having a lot of, I've been involved in a lot of conversations around AI, um, and, and I'm constantly being told that technology is neutral. Uh, and, you know, obviously that raises my blood pressure and I push back. Um, but I think that there's great investment in the idea that technology is neutral and that it is outside of society. And by believing that, it allows us to believe in something outside of ourselves. I mean, frankly, right? Almost spiritual. Right? And so to say, like, there is something outside of ourselves. There is something that's unproblematic in this very problematic world. And if we can appeal to something that's unproblematic, if this unproblematic thing can solve this problem, then that can get us out of the, you know, this horrible experience that manual scavengers have or the horrible you know, circumstances that a lot of marginalized communities have. Um, you know, across the world, and, and including in India. And I think that that has enormous power despite, you know, our lived experience with technology. Um, and I think that that, it, there's also a dimension that the pe that you still have, and I haven't, certainly I'm, I'm working on, I'm in the midst of working all of this out, right? Um, but this is something I think about in the Indian context in particular, right? You have people, many of whom have, um, as I said, like some of them are part of these communities and they, you know, and then they leave and they, you know, they were good students and then they go and they, you know, uh, get a technical education and it seems like, okay, well now I can go back and help through technology because it's something outside of, um, outside of ourselves. So it's, it's, um, even though at the same time the experience that marginalized communities often have with technology is not like that at all. It's not of a, of a liberatory object. It's often a deeply problematic object. They're not, you know, they're the ones who are experiencing, you know, who, who desperately need a toilet in, in the city of Bengaluru and then they go and they find that the smart toilet that's been built has not been maintained so it can't be used, right? Um, and I'm sure all of, you know, the, the one could talk about many more, many more cases. But I think that there, there's something there that it's not just about the neutrality, the idea that it's outside of our foibles and frailties, um, but also that the people who are engaged in this innovation themselves see it is in that way when marginalized communities don't necessarily see it in the same way. Somebody got a price tag to put in a plumbing system throughout India? I have done a... Uh -huh. 
Yes, so um, I, I, I'm not an expert on China. I have been to China. I have not been to, I've been mostly in Chinese cities, so I can't really speak to the China problem. My sense is that there is um, pretty good sewer infrastructure in China. Uh, I don't know if anybody else knows about the rural um, situation. I think it's also important there's two things to, important to um, note is that, I mean, on some level, manual scavenging um, as a practice existed everywhere before the advent of sanitation. It's just that in India, it's had a certain stickiness because of, of caste. Um, and then as for your first question about the cost, um, has anybody actually looked at the cost of sewer infrastructure? I would say two things. The first is that um, no, uh, I never. I have looked historically at a lot of international organization documents. I've never. Everybody always just said it's too expensive, and then they stopped talking about it. But I think one of the things that's crucial to remember about this, you know, and I think is hopefully evident in what I'm talking about, is that uh, sewer infrastructure is just another technology. It would not solve the problem. Sorry? It wouldn't solve the problem of manual scavenging. It might solve the health problems. Right? But it wouldn't actually solve the problem of manual scavenging because what you have in India is now the manual scavengers are in going down into sewers to fix clogs. Right? So it, it doesn't actually solve that problem. And in fact, they're not necessarily having appropriate you know, protective gear when they're doing that. Right? Some of the images that I showed were examples of that. So it wouldn't solve. That's, that's kind of the conundrum, is that we're trying to solve a social problem with a technological solution. But I mean, we don't, we don't have manual in our sewer system. Right. We don't. Right, exactly. In the US, we don't, because it's not a social problem in the US. We have you know, up to a certain level. Uh, yeah, we do, right. We have janitors. We have people who work in sanitation. They aren't um, uh, discriminated against in the way that they are in India, right? That, that, and that persists. Right? So what, what, what's the solution, sorry? You have this incredible infrastructure in terms of sewers and everything. Do we have an open defecation problem yeah. in Long Beach right now? Right, <laughs> right, yeah. No, I mean, I, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly, yeah. Yes. That's I saw cool. a pretty interesting video from Business Insider India who uh, was talking from, it's an agricultural community. I can't remember exactly where it was in Thailand. Uh, I know it was somewhere located in India. And they were, had basically um, managed to create their own hybrid nutmeg trees. So it was their own uh, nutmeg trees that were better than the market standards in India. So it was like a community that basically like owned their own trees that they could sell, like they could cultivate, grow, and sell. So it was like a community who owned their own product and was allowing them to mm -hmm. make profit and um, sell a better product. So I just wanted to ask about your thoughts on like kind of a community owning their own, basically the workers owning their own industry. Yeah. Their yeah. Own little section of the industry, if you had anything. <laughs> so... I think that's that's very interesting, and it's something that I've been thinking about it both in this context and in other work I'm doing. Right, the difference between what I've been describing and what you're describing is that in that case the community is defining the problem and developing the solution. Right, so it comes very it's very much driven um, in that way. And what's interesting to me is that you know that's where a lot of the intention starts with inclusive innovation, so the idea of grassroots innovation is that, right? It is, you know, so the Anil Gupta, who I mentioned before, does a yearly walk in a different part of India with the idea of identifying, you know, innovations at the source and then, um, you know, sort of uh, supporting them and helping them grow and, and you know, and, and become bigger. Um, but along the way, right, so Muruganantham was one of those cases. He got funding from the National Innovation Foundation, right? So the question is then, is there something about when it hits, you know, the broader market forces and the market economy that pushes values of, for example, scalability, 
but other kinds of moral, um, you know, sort of stickiness that makes it less um, useful um, or liberating to those communities. I mean, I, I'm, I am also, this is right, exactly, I alluded to it, it's the central thing that I'm wrestling with and trying to think through is, you know, I think what's interesting to me about the idea of inclusive innovation is that it starts in that place, um, in, a, in this very good place, and then somewhere along the way, um, it turns into something else, and it's not necessarily as effective. Or, and, and I would say at the same time, there are parts of even the imagination of inclusive capital or inclusive innovation um, that aren't actually as inclusive as they seem, right? Um, so inclusion, but not necessarily um, equity or empowerment. So how might we imagine a different kind of marketplace, a different kind of capitalism that actually did um, start from the needs of these communities. Yeah, I mean, and the other thing to, right, because, and implicitly in all of this, right, there's a, there is a privatization happening in sanitation and hygiene, and what you're implicitly saying is, maybe there are spaces where there shouldn't be privatization at all. Right? Yeah. Uh, thank you for the really interesting talk. I don't think it was gross at all. So thank it you for that. Um, I'm curious, uh, you sort of mentioned in, in passing occasionally the, the social cultural context. And I'm curious to what extent these projects or products like these think about that at all or build that into the way they market, sell their ideas, right? Because I mean, from what I'm understanding, sort of a possible part of your argument is that none of this is going to work if we can't bring sort of the social and cultural development along. So mm -hmm. is that something that some of these innovators are recognizing and how are they trying to figure that part out? Yeah, and, and and some of the audience will know that the same that the star of the Padman movie was also the star of the toilet Bollywood movie, um, and that is in fact the method for dealing with social and cultural context. So it is rarely um, a consideration when developing the solution. To go back to this point about the neutral the supposed neutrality of technology, one. If one assumed that technology was objective and neutral, then you wouldn't need to think about context at the front end. Instead, what you see repeatedly, despite um, evidence that it's not only ineffective but actually detrimental, is the use of is, is the consider consideration of social and cultural context on the back end, right? So you know investments in movies to convince people to engage in particular behaviors. Um, or, you know, the most famous uh, example is what's called community-led uh, total sanitation, which is community-led in the sense that it, it's, it, I was sort of referring to a version of this before, um, you know, sort of community-based surveillance uh, of sanitation, of, you know, of open defecation. Um, and so that's supposed to be tweaked according to the social context. 
but it's really an educational campaign, right? So and that, in that way, it is um, very similar to the traditional tech solutionism um, mode, and it's not as, as um, innovative in that way as it, as it potentially could be and maybe would be if we wanted it to be more effective. Totally up to you. I think let's do a couple and then okay. you can talk about it. Okay. Uh, I, I like one of the poster here. Uh, no toilet, no bride. Yes, How that's that the campaign is working out. <laughs> and <laughs> instead of dowry. <laughs> I do not I have heard of stories of um, I mean I think it did uh, empower some people to say that's how it should be, um, you know, the, to um, encourage toilet construction. Is it real? Is it like, or just uh, you put it there? Or no, that's a movie. Oh, really? Yeah, so it's Akshay Kumar uh, who starred in both the um, toilet story and the... And, and the gentleman from Singapore, I think he works, he came up with a, uh, some innovative... Uh, He's a, he travels all over, all over the world. I forgot his name. I was watching uh, on the YouTube. It might be the person who created... Chi Chinese descent or something. I Probably. think, yeah. It's, so he created something. I'm now forgetting that it's some sort of international toilet there organization. I think that's it. Who were, who were showing, showing the modern toilet. I think they did talk to each other or something. Bindeshwar Patak, so. yeah. That was in the 70s, so that was before, and that's interesting too, to go back to our conversation, which is Patek's approach is quite different than the inclusive innovation approach. So he didn't patent his invention, he was interested in widespread dissemination, um, you know, he really frames his work more in the um, uh, social, uh, social organization, nonprofit uh, line as opposed to the market-driven approach. So that's interesting to think about as well. Yes. So in the area of uh, hygiene and sanitation, let's say we define success along the metrics of uh, reducing disease and in some way, of, if we could, if measure cultural changes, let's say we define it that way. In your research for your book, have you come across you know, uh, inclusive innovations that succeeded based on that definition, and uh, what are the differences that they had compared to these poor solutions? I'm assuming they still are going, they're not bankrupt, these companies are different. These companies are still going, yeah. Yeah, so have you come across a solution that did it, and why they succeeded, and they, these things? Did I would say that all of these have succeeded in little bits. If we define it All of these have succeed, cause succeeded in little bits, and they failed in little bits, and that's what makes them, um, I think, interesting to consider, right? So I think by your assessments, you know, certainly the Garv, you know, I, I think it's hard to analyze. I will say that none of them offer those kinds of data. Um, you know, often the data is the number of technologies, so that's interesting, right? So they talk about the number of objects and use those as a proxy for assumptions about those metrics of success. It's, but, you know, what you see is um, kind of very aggregate numbers about health outcomes from the rise of toilet construction in India, for example, but not, not directly related to any particular innovation. Saying that like having something is better than doing nothing, right? So if if their cost is justified compared to the benefits that they can we define them as a failure or can we say, well, they did they achieved something and then so they are successful. Right. So I think that the important thing to think about is that in all of these cases Right? There are different kinds of harms. In some cases, there are environmental harms, for example, in the increase, increased disposable sanitary pads. 
Um, there are often political harms in terms of loss of civil rights and civil liberties. Um, and, you know, in other cases there are health harms or, you know, so, so I think in all of these cases they do ha also have those sorts of harms. They're not necessarily all, you know, health benefits and health harms, right? And that's the complexity of dealing with these kinds of challenges that often aren't considered in the primarily technical and economic framing um, or health framing that we usually have. One more. Yes. In the context of um, disposable or non-disposable sanitary napkins, the menstrual cup comes out as a winner, low tech, not as sexual, but viable. Yes, but this is where we return to the social and cultural question, right? I think, especially in the Indian context, the menstrual cup becomes a very complicated um, consideration. Um, you know, in terms of like how women know their bodies and girls know their bodies and you know those kinds of issues and if you don't start it at the level of girls then are women going to take this up, right? So there's that set of issues. Um, I will say that also in discussions about menstrual cups in this context, there again you have a lot of um, assumptions being made and in that case then the assumption is, oh well, they won't know how to use these technologies or they're under unclean conditions. We can't, assume, you know, the reason why, for example, cloth is not seen as an appropriate solution either and disposable is seen as the appropriate solution is that in this context, under these conditions, with this population, you know, the assumption is that all they can, you know, manage is a disposable, right? That's the best, cleanest um, solution. So that goes back to these, um, uh, what I was saying before about the kind of moral um, uh, biases, frankly, that are, that are reinforced by, um, by particular technological solutions. Well, thank you for wonderful questions. Praveen Sinha. Hi, Praveen. Nice to meet you. I'm in the College of Business here. Oh, great. Yeah. Um, has any 